Okay, everybody, uh, we're just going to pause for just a moment, make sure everybody's logged on and getting into the Zoom room here and making sure our Facebook Live is going. So just bear with us for a second and we'll get going. All right, looks like we're streaming and running everywhere. Hey, everybody, this is Jeff Martin with Magic City Books. So thrilled to have you here with us for kind of a, a rare Sunday afternoon event. We usually are kind of doing things on Monday nights and Thursday evenings, but we had a super uh, fun opportunity fall into our into our uh, laps here. We wanted to do that. Also, we wanted to do something to celebrate uh, you know, spring, spring is here. Happy spring, everybody out there. You know, I know that um, it's been quite a uh, quite a year. So I think we're certainly welcoming those warmer temps and flowers and all the all the things that spring brings uh, to help us get into a little bit better place. We're going to keep doing these virtual author events for a while. We've been doing them going on a year now. We've done about 120 plus author events virtually in the last year. And all kinds of stuff, you know, it's been great. You know, we've talked to everybody from, gosh, you know, Rachel Maddow and uh, John Grisham to, you know, Ibram X. Kindy and ta Coates and all kinds of amazing folks. Um, we try to get what I call kind of a mixtape. We want to be talking about issues that matter and, you know, very, you know, topical things. But we also want to have moments where we are having some levity or maybe, you know, talking about Italian cooking or something, just having some breaks in the in the uh, in in the in the um, programming that we're doing. So anyway, I hope you'll stick with us for that. Go to our website, MagicCityBooks.com. You can see the full schedule of everything. We'll put a link here so you can see that. Um, and you know, hope to see you there. It's a great way to stay connected. There's a lot of people that are watching from outside of Oklahoma, outside of Tulsa, outside of the United States sometimes. And um, that's one of the benefits of this new technology, but I can't wait to be back in person. So we hope to see you there um, sometime this, you know, maybe we'll say fall, summer, we'll see what happens with that. So I, I um, read Benjamin Moser's book on Susan Sontag when it came out in hardback. And um, it was one of those books that kind of knocked me flat because it felt to me as if it was a, uh, an impossible task. You know, this idea that you could take such a life and put it into some kind of box, the box being a book and contain the multitudes that someone like Susan Sontag had inside of her. Um, and, you know, the, the mere feat of that, being able to do that, uh, what was quite impressive to me. And when the book was awarded the Pulitzer Prize, it felt exactly right to me because of the achievement that the book is. And so um, I, I didn't know if we would have a chance to do that, but you know, through the magic of Instagram and connecting in all these strange ways, we were able to connect with, with, with Ben and uh, make this event happen. So I couldn't be more thrilled to have Benjamin Moser joining us from his hideaway in rural France joining us here virtually. So hello, Benjamin, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, um, like I said, congratulations on the book. I know you've you know had a thousand zillion congrats and you've won all the awards, but it really was um, to me just kind of a, a knockout read. And uh, you know, someone who I, I, I think had been present in my life, you know, in some ways, intellectually and literarily for so long. But as I mentioned, I you know never could quite contain everything that she was and did. You know, I, I think like many people, I knew parts of her story. You know, I had read notes on camp. I'd read her writings on photography and some of those things. But, you know, there was so much of her life that I was not familiar with. And in some ways, I don't know how anybody except you could be because of all the time and effort that it takes. But my first question to you is this, do you see her, Susan Sontag, as kind of the last of her kind? Meaning like, we don't have these kind of public intellectuals, these writers kind of on the stage that she did. And now we've lost the Norman Mailers and the Gore Vidals. And, you know, we have Gloria Steinem still with us, you know, but, you know, to talk about, the place she held and what was now missing since she's been gone. Well, I don't think we do have someone like that. And I do think we miss it. I really do. I think that almost all of the debate that I see going on, they're either left versus right, but they're more often left versus left and right versus right. And, you know, it's increasingly fractured and 
we really miss authoritative voices, I think, who really can say, okay, everybody, shut up and listen. This is what we're talking about now. And who could set the agenda in the way that she did. I mean, and she did it for almost 50 years. Um, really, you know, you mentioned Notes on Camp, which is the moment she really kind of bursts onto the consciousness of people outside a very small intellectual circle. Um, and from that all the way to the Iraq war, uh, she really, people stopped and listened to her. And I think that they felt, even the people who really hated her and who disagreed with her, of whom there were many, they felt in some ways that they had to respond to her. You know, there, there, was, there was somebody that had the kind of voice that could set the agenda for good or for evil. And um, I miss that. I mean, I feel like who am I supposed to pay attention to? Just as a person who doesn't know everything, you know, I know a lot about different things that I know about, but I don't know about everything. Um, and I'd like to know, like, who's the person that I should, you know, like, where should I go first? And there's just so many voices yelling at you all the time. Um, but I think it's important to realize that she actually was unique, even before her time, you know, when she shows up, there had always been a tradition of American intellectuals, of course. Um, these were writers, some of them were well known in a certain way that would have been outside the box of the, you know, the, the literary or intellectual or publishing world. But they weren't that many, really. And there was, certainly had never been a woman First of all, there had been like one woman per generation. I mean, that's what she used to joke about. She was the dark lady of American letters because they could only have, like America could only accept you know, one woman every 25 years. Um, and she was also really young and she was very beautiful. I think it's important to remember how good looking she was and how that made her somebody who could write these essays that were very complex and that sounded like somebody who was a French philosopher but also she was somebody who could be in the media. And this is something that's really rare now. You know, we have a lot of very learned and important people, but they're not the kind of people who are gonna be on the cover of Vanity Fair in the way that she was. I mean, this is really something that's unique and a lot of people try to imitate it and never successfully. <laughs> it was a very unusual combination. You mentioned um, um, her, media presence and her, her, her beauty, and she was uh, quite mm. stunning. Uh, and, you know, when you think back to those, the kind of trio, and, it, you know, it, obviously we're two, you know, guys talking about this, but it, it's an interesting concept. You said, you know, there could only be one at a time. You think about someone like a Gloria Steinem, for example, or someone even right. like Jermaine Greer, you so much, you know, like it or not, you know, these were stunningly beautiful women who kind of had an aesthetic presence in the media. Like they were kind of fashions, they were icons in a, in a fashion sense and a kind of style icon in a certain way. And Susan Sontag with her shock of white that she eventually had and all of that played very much into the kind of that, that, um, her, her, just her, her presence on the, on the stage, you know, um, is there, was she aware of that, do you think? And that, did she use that in, in, in any way? Well, she wasn't totally aware of it when she was young. I think like a lot of people, um, she was kind of this awkward teenager who blossomed into this really stunning woman. And you mentioned, just as a parenthesis, you mentioned Jermaine and, uh, and Gloria Steinem, who were also famously gorgeous women. Um, to the point that some people have argued that it actually hurt feminism, that all the most famous feminists were so beautiful because it made it harder for them to reach your average housewife in Oklahoma, you know, who, um, and, and, and people told me this. I mean, I've, I've, I've interviewed a lot of people who felt that feminism was like just for rich ladies and on Park Avenue. Um, but the other part of the question, it's absolutely essential um, to women writers and artists, particularly writers. You know, I mean, I've written two biographies of women writers, Susan Sontag and Clarissa Spector, both of whom were very beautiful and both of whom also wrote a lot about this. I mean, I think that anybody who pretends that it's not important what you look like um, is living in a different world than you and I are probably living in. I mean, and, and, or that Susan Sontag or Clarissa Spector was living in. 
I mean, most of the great women writers are very aware of appearance and how it can construct you and how it can destroy you. Because of course, once it goes, it goes. And there's something that is very terrifying about that. Um, Clarissa Spector was a, a beauty columnist for decades. You know, she wrote everything that you can imagine about what perfume to wear and how to do your mascara. And a lot of people dismiss this as trivial, but I think it's only trivial to the extent that every, you know, unless you really think that everything external is, is, is superficial and all that there is is your deep soul. Um, you know, so Sontag wrote quite a lot about beauty, the future of beauty, how beauty was being changed by feminism, how it was used to condemn women, even as it was used to build them up, um, and what it was like to live that way. You know, she had had that experience of being this magnetic beauty. And then when she's quite young, you know, she's 42, which is younger than I am, um, when she got stage four breast cancer and um, had this terrible mastectomy, um, at the time, this is really brutal. I mean, it's still brutal, but this is 50 years ago almost. You know, um, she becomes frail. She becomes unsure in her body. She feels that her sexuality has been destroyed by this operation. Um, you know, so this is a very real thing. I think that, that it's not a service to pretend like it doesn't matter. I think it matters a lot. Otherwise, I mean, it's probably the biggest industry in the world. If you think about how much people spend on clothes and makeup and plastic surgery, <laughs> you know, and this is billions and billions. So um, I, I'd love to see feminist thinkers now kind of come to terms with that from, a, from the kind of ambiguity that a lot of the previous um, generations of women writers have, have come at it. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting if you line up the kind of male counterparts of the time, it's not uh, the Rat Pack, you know, we're talking, you know, and Philip Roth, no. and your Norman Mailers, and, you know, those people were not traditionally, you know, they're, they're not Rock Hudson, you know what I'm saying? No, but that's changed. It's interesting that you say Rock Hudson, because of course he was gay, and um, the gay way of looking at women, which often shapes how fashion and how you know, your hairdresser and the makeup artist, all that, those are often gay men. Um, and that same eye goes on to other men. And I think that what we've seen now is a kind of homosexualization, if is that a word, of how men are looked at. You know, because if you look at 40 years ago, those guys didn't think they needed to lose 30 pounds. Nobody ever said that to them you know, their sort of sexiness wasn't about what they looked like. I mean, it was if you were an actor or something. Um, but that changed. And you see that that, I mean, it makes guys better looking in general, I would say, but it also brings into male lives the same kind of oppressive structures that have always uh, been present for women. So um, I think it's a fascinating evolution. I think that it's gonna keep evolving still more. Do you think that um, you mentioned Clarice Lispector, who you wrote a, a great book about, I don't know, 10 plus 10 years ago or more, and um, is someone who that I think has, it's been really interesting seeing how she has become kind of embraced by like the millennial kind of, for lack of a better word, kind of hipster generation. And there's a few people who have like there's there's this kind of re-embracing of like Joan Didion by kind of younger women who are, you know, around now and people like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, Eve Babbitts and, you know, a lot of these people. I don't see that as happening as much for Susan Sontag, you know, whereas like 20 year old, you know, young women are, are, aren't kind of just espousing that. She hasn't kind of caught on to the Instagram memification of like her quotes and everything she says. Do you think there is a, any reason for why she has not kind of been reintroduced into kind of that cultural space? Well, it's interesting. I mean, are you noticing that at the bookstore? That are her books not selling as well? I, I mean, think, how, what are you? I, I think that, to be honest with you, your book about her is much more in the conversation than anyone reading or talking about books by her. Now, I think there are moments for like Notes on Camp where it kind of reemerges right. every now and then. But in some ways, that's beyond her as a person. It's the topic that's more the interest than 
than her. So I just don't see it where it's like people aren't walking around with Susan Sontag book bags with her picture on them and they're not kind of getting not, not getting embraced by the kind of literati of the moment. And maybe that's just me, but I just don't see it as much. Well, I think it's, I mean, I'm asking because I think it's true. That's my anecdotal opinion, uh, you know, being over here, also being locked in my house, what do I really know about this? But it is my impression that you know, with Clarice, she was utterly unknown when I wrote that book. And it was actually a very scary book to write because nobody ever heard of her. I didn't have a publisher for it. Nobody wanted it. Nobody thought it was interesting or understood why I thought it was important. And then over the last 10 plus years, you know, we've published one after the next of new translations of her work that allow people to understand what's so important about her. And so she's really a discovery. You know, I mean, she really didn't exist and now she exists. And I'm very proud of that. I mean, I think that's, um, I, I feel like that's a real contribution that I've been able to make. I'm really lucky to have been in the position to do it. But um, I think, you know, one of the things is that those were translations, whereas Susan's not translated. I mean, she's in English, so you don't really need, you don't have this big moment where you're gonna like reveal to the world this book that you've never heard of because you've heard of all the books. The other thing is that Susan is really, really fascinating uh, to read about because she takes you to another time. So we're talking about different changes in feminism. You can talk also about disease, you know, like about cancer and about what it's like to be discovered to have cancer um, and what the treatment is like and what the ideas around cancer are. Um, but like, I, for me, a lot of what's so interesting about Sontag is exactly like how how she, like how much has changed and what her life shows you about those changes. And I do feel like her life is in a lot of ways even more interesting than her work. And even when I was reading the, um, you know, when I was preparing this book, writing it for all these years, I really did notice that almost everyone, so like the, you know, you mentioned notes on camp and on photography. So that's not different from my, position when I came into this. I had read kind of the things that everybody read in college, um, which was really limited. You know, it was really, she's also an essayist. So you don't really feel like you have to read the whole book because you can read an essay and then you've read that essay. That's a complete work. Um, but when I was interviewing people, especially people that I kind of thought were the people that knew everything and read everything, I noticed the same thing. I was like, they don't even know what they're talking about because that's not what she said in the next chapter of that same book. They've only read this one chapter. So I started noticing that. And I really wanted it to, um, I really think Susan is an education. I think she is a, she teaches you, me, anyone, more about modern culture and art than just about any other modern writer. Um, so, you know, I, I really ho hoped that my book would be kind of a door into that. I can't add though that abroad, so in countries where she does have to be translated, um, including here in France, in Holland, <clears throat> in Germany, um, in Latin America, and a lot of places, my book has led to her being retranslated or reissued. And so there has been more of a discovery of her in other countries. So that's nice for me. Um, because I do like to, if I do a biography, it's because I want the work to, you know, get some new breath, get some new life. Do you think that, um, I, I've always had this idea, you know, especially since I was reading, I think the, the relationship that brought it most to mind was the relationship between um, David Foster Wallace and Jonathan Franz. And it made me think about the idea that these people like a David Foster Wallace who are so kind of naturally observant and can explain the world in a way that seems like breathing to them, but would take us and everybody else, you know, a lifetime to kind of get the same observation. Their true passion though is writing fiction, even though what comes naturally to them is this non-fictional observational um, way of looking at the world. To me that very much, and, and for example, I know plenty of novelists who want to write the great American essay, but their skill is just naturally telling stories, you know? And I think it's- Really? 
Yeah, I feel like it's either they way. Want to try. I've never heard that. I love that because I want to write the great American novel, but I don't really think I can. Well, see, that's exactly the point I'm getting to. You know, Susan Sontag, you know, won a, won a National Book Award fairly late in life, you know, for um, my brain just dropped. What was the novel she won the National Book in Award? In America. In America. You know, and I feel like when you see her work, her fiction to me felt, felt pretty flat, but her nonfiction writing to me felt like what she was just kind of born to do. Um, yeah, you just mentioned you hadn't kind of thought about that way. You know, was she always wanting to be the great American novelist? And did she see her work as lesser, like her novels and her, her fiction writing as kind of the higher achievement than her essays and commentary on, on, on American life? Oh, yeah, definitely. That was her dream was to be a great novelist. I think it, you know, she grew up in a time when the novel was considered the great form. It was the thing that the really important writer wrote a great novel or wrote many great novels. Um, you know, and that was not true even 20, 30 years before her, um, when poetry, for example, was considered much more prestigious. Um, and so the great writer was a great poet. Um, in America, it would have been, I mean, in the United States, I should say to not confuse the title of the you know, it would have been someone like Robert Frost or someone like, um, you know, Walt Whitman, or those were the considered the great novelists and, and nobody really was that interested in, in Herman Melville until the twenties, you know, because no one really was that interested in novels. Um, so that changes, it's just one of these things that happens in literary life, uh, fashions come and go, but it was very important to her not only because of that, but I think that because she felt that the fiction writer the, had access to a sort of inner freedom that she didn't have. She really uh, was always trying to liberate herself from what she calls Miss Librarian in her, in her diaries, you know, who's this kind of nerdy person who puts 58 footnotes at the end of every sentence. You know, she wanted to express herself more freely she wanted to create something that was really alive, you know, these figures, which is kind of the fantasy of a lot of people who write. And um, so she writes these really weird novels, these two novels in the 60s, The Benefactor and Death Kit, which I don't know if you've ever read, but nobody's really ever read them. Um, I mean, I can't say rush out and buy them. You know, I can't like, I can't do that to people. I have to read them because it's my job, you know, but I actually, like they're horrible to read, but they're also great to read because you learn a lot about the ways that people in the 60s, sort of after the first, I mean, after the Second World War, were really trying to rethink how do you portray life? You know, is it, is it, does it have the cohesion and the elegance of a good novel where every sentence is perfectly leads to the next one and every action that someone does leads to the next action and everybody and all kind of works out. We know that life is not like that, you know? I mean, life is a big mess. So how do you reflect that in fiction? How do you reflect that in film? You know, there's a whole, especially here in France, but not only in France, there was this attempt to make kind of non-narrative films and they're totally unwatchable. Um, and so is a lot of the music that comes out of that time. It's just like horrible to listen to. But you realize like we're really used to harmony. We're really used to narrative. We're really used to everything kind of working out in a smooth line. We really like to be entertained, you know, because if it's not like, you know, if, if, if your third paragraph is boring, then you can see on the algorithm that everybody clicks off to the next piece. And so then you lose your job because your third paragraph is born. I mean, this is not really an exaggeration. Like this is, you know, you have to entertain people. And sometimes novels are boring and tedious and awful and you learn a whole lot from them. So, but it's just not what you, as a novel reader, you're not, you want, even if you're someone who's like, no, I don't have, I don't think everything has to be some silly Disney movie, like dancing bears. But then you realize like, actually we all are kind of conditioned to that. Um, we all sort of like, we want, we want all this kind of stuff that we've come to expect from certain narratives. So, you know, in that sense, when you read her novels, you learn about another path that 
people didn't take. And why did they not take it? I think because of publishing. You know, I think that like publishing is not a very friendly, I mean, big publishing and it's increasing all huge publishing or tiny publishing. You know, there's nothing really in between. Like I do the Clarice books for New Directions, which is one of the last places that's like not a huge corporation, but it's also relevant in New York and the books get reviewed in the Times and all that. Um, it's very hard to find that kind of space as a writer. So um, I think that's, I don't know. I, and one more thing. I mean, some of her fiction is actually pretty okay. You know, um, I like the volcano <laughs> is that lover. The blurb, is that like. the blurb? The blurb is it's pretty okay. Well, I've written about this. Um, I've defended her fiction a lot because actually it is kind of weird and it's like not what you're expecting, but it's really clever. You know, I mean, it's not, it's, and I think people like to kind of shit on it because they're intimidated by her. And she's like this figure that's so intimidating that they kind of want to just have something to feel kind of superior about. You know, like when you're in some like really rich person's mansion and everybody's like, I hate this wallpaper, you know, just because <laughs> it makes them feel better about themselves. <laughs> you know? And um, and I think that, you know, some of her essays also are not good. You know, some of her essays are wrong. Um, so I think what's fascinating as a biographer, and I hope as a reader of my biography, is that you can see this person thinking. You know, she's not somebody who's always right. She's not this like immobile figure of Shakespearean perfection. She's just a person thinking. Um, I want to say for everybody watching, if you would like to get a copy of Sontag and you don't have it already, or if you'd like to get one as a gift or just to read it more than once and have a fresh new copy to read, uh, we've got links here in the chat. So we'll keep posting those there. And also, if you have questions while, while Benjamin and I are, are talking, please drop those in the Q&A and I'll ask those as we're going. Um, I was trying to think of well, after rereading the book and prepping for this, I was kind of went on YouTube deep dive watching interviews with Susan Sontag and she was quite a combative interviewer. And my, some of my favorite ones were done with like WGBH and, and um, maybe it was Chicago or maybe it was in Boston, whatever the public, it was either the Boston. Oh, is that or, about Camille Paglia? That's one of them, yeah. And and so, man, those are so awkward and, and, and kind of tense. Um, and she's probably like, you know, in her late 50s, early 60s at that time. And I think kind of feeling like maybe this, you know, culture had passed her by or whatever. But here's my question about that. Her presence was so, I don't know. Here's my, what would, if Susan Sontag was 45 years old now in 2021, she would have a podcast, I would imagine. And she, you know, what, what would she be commenting on? You know, like, would she be railing against, what, what would she be kind of, you know, she died, what, 15, 16 years ago? I can't remember exactly. What year did she die? 2004, six, yeah. 17 years 17 ago. 17 years wow. ago. Wow. And so, so you know, yeah. on the Susan, Son Susan Sontag podcast, what would she be? What would her, what would her kind of topics be in 2021? What do you think she would be railing against or championing? Well, I think she would be championing the same kinds of works that she always championed, which were things that pushed the envelope, that were daring, that were new, that were that were modern. Um, I think that one of the things that she really would hate, and it probably would have destroyed her career if she existed now, um, the idea that people have on social media, especially that anybody, because I mean, 45, I'm 44, you know, we are now elderly compared to, um, a lot of the people who are in charge of, of a lot of the media. And it's very scary for people my age because we're not actually old enough to be um, super established. I mean, some of us are more than others, but you know, writing careers are long. They're, they're, you know, there's a lot of time between books. There's a, they're difficult to do. It's not, I mean, there's a few people that I can think of who are really successful in their 20s, but Really, I mean, of my generation, I can think of a couple, Jonathan Safran Four and Zadie Smith mm -hmm. and a couple of others, you know, but basically a writer's career is a slow burn. Um, it's not like you, you know, it's, it's hard. And the, the emphasis now on canceling everybody and 
yelling at everybody and not letting people make mistakes in their lives and judging everybody um, based on some tweet. It's really scary um, for people because it, what it does is it makes you censor yourself. Um, and I've lived in Latin America, as I'm sure you know. I mean, my, I have a lot of experience with censorship in Latin America, uh, not only of my own work, but of other, more of other people's work, because I'm an American, so I can write whatever I want, and nobody in Paraguay, I mean, they can try to sue me, but it doesn't really affect anything I do. Um, but I think that the thing that's really scary about Latin America, I think a lot of Americans think of it as like there's some kernel, you know, with like an eye patch sitting there like with a gun telling you, you can't put this in your book. Like that's never how it worked in Latin America. I mean, there were, you know, there were brutal moments of censorship, but it worked much more effectively because it got in people's heads. Um, and so people would think 50 times before they said anything. And you notice this when you interview Latin Americans is that they're much more careful than Americans. Um, they really, they don't love being interviewed. I mean, Americans love being interviewed. This is one of the great differences between these two books is like, it's so easy to interview Americans because they love to talk about themselves. But like, um, but Latin Americans, you know, they kind of want another reference about you and they want to be sure and they want to see the quotes and they want to do this. Um, and that's because they have this history of, of, of this kind of censorship. So I think that that has come to the United States in a big way. And I think that Sontag, um, her whole legacy, I mean, there's so many legacies, but one of the legacies is I think the freedom to fuck everything up and to get, get it wrong. She got a lot of stuff wrong. Um, and that's what's so interesting about her is that the stuff she gets right often emerges from the stuff that she gets wrong. So, um, so you don't think she would have the, 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 the instant reaction and kind of the outrage machine that exists today, she wouldn't have had the opportunity to make mistakes, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, I really do. And I think a lot of her books too, we're talking about some of the fiction stuff. Um, a lot of her books flopped. Um, in a way that would not be allowed today. You wouldn't be able to publish, if you got X advance um, and you sold 2000 copies and you did that two or three times, even if you were well known um, in the way that she already was when she was pretty young, um, she'd have a very hard time publishing. Um, it's really a, it's a, it's an environment now that I think really needs free people more than ever before. I, I think people, like we as writers need to, for ourselves, we need to force ourselves to be uncomfortable in a certain way, um, in a way that I think maybe 20 years ago wasn't so important. Um, and I think she's such a model of that, of the free mind. Yeah, you know, it's it's pretty, uh, it's an interesting thought to think about a, a su at Susan Sontag on Twitter and what that would be like. Um, so it'd be kind of horrifying. I'm glad, I'm really glad she could shoot off her mouth at people. You know, she really could. I'm sure you saw that, especially as she gets older. I think she's just tired of all the bullshit. You know, mm -hmm. she's just like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, but I think that the real writing for all of us, definitely including her, comes out of taking a step back not always leaning into every societal debate. There are some people who can do that. I mean, I was looking at Glenn Greenwald's tweets today, just which I do sometimes, because he's always like yelling at somebody and it's always kind of hilarious, but like he has the energy to go full combat mode with all these people on the internet of whom there are millions, as we know, um, and also write books. And he has 20 dogs and he has two kids and his husband's in Congress. I mean, it's a, not everybody has that energy. I think most people really kind of need to focus on what's important and not shoot off their mouths as much as we're often encouraged to. Um, you know, this this line of questioning makes me think about something and, you know, maybe this was silly. So you can, you, if this is a dumb question, please let me know. But I was thinking about notes on camp and I was thinking about 
the legacy of Sontag and the way that through that and, and other things, she was, you know, maybe more than anybody, the leading voice on the flattening of culture and taking away the hierarchical nature of what we consider to be high culture, low culture. And you can draw a direct line from that to reality television, and you can draw a direct line between that and, you know, it's hard to argue that there's not camp in Donald Trump, right? Oh, well, is camp, you know, in a lot of ways. And yeah. do you think that by default, the lessening of kind of taking away the barriers of like what's valued in society had negative repercussions down the road? Well, this is a really important question. Yes, I have answered this question a hundred times, but I will happily do it again because it is really important to understand, you know, the reason that she was identified with this, I think was a mistake. You know, her idea with notes on camp was not to break down the traditional canon and the traditional hierarchy to which she was absolutely 1000% loyal. I mean, she sort of embodied the canon in her every breath. Um, but of course, as we know, these canons were old, you know, and, and someone told me that in, in the 60s, in grad school, English didn't go past the two Jameses, you know, Joyce and Henry. <laughs> so, you know, now we're talking about like, how do you include women in that camp? How do you include African-Americans? How do you include gay people? How do you include people who are excluded by all sorts of marginalizations and, and the political oppressions that we now think are antiquated and bad? Um, that, that was absolutely considered flattening. So even in the 60s, Columbia, Virginia Woolf was considered not okay on the English syllabus. Um, you know, you didn't even have, like the first Jewish professor of English didn't happen at, you know, it was Lionel Trilling, who I don't think was actually got tenure until the late 50s, even though he was one of the most internationally renowned scholars in the world, because he was Jewish. You know, I think it's hard to recall that, just how conservative those canons were and how repressive. So of course there's room to open that up. Um, what she didn't like, and she was absolutely opposed to, was saying everything's the same. So saying that Andy Warhol is the same thing as Rembrandt, you know, she would just lose her mind um, that every, that every cultural expression is equally valid. Um, that's, I think, where we've gone now. And um, I, that makes me ill, to be honest. I think it's, um, I, I've become very conservative on that account. I think that um, if I were designing a school, I went to school, you know, we learned Latin in school and I'm from Texas, you know, I'm not from Oxford or somewhere. Um, we learned, there was a canon, you know, and you learned it and it was a list. It wasn't everything and nobody thought it was everything, but it gave you a kind of baggage, I think, that you could um, then, I ended up studying Portuguese, you know, just for the hell of it. And, um, but I knew my own language and I knew my own tradition and Sontag, uh, Sontag was a very big defender of that. And I think, I mean, I, I just, my heart breaks for her that you blame her for reality television. I really think that like, <laughs> you know, she, she deserves better, um, you know, but she did think that like, you know, there was a lot of um, even pop music. Some of it was really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I'm curious, you know, so much of your work has been in, in, as a translator and working in translation. And when, when, just as a little bit of an aside, so we'll get back on track in a moment, but I'm curious, when you have a book like this, um, most writers I've interviewed have no involvement at all in their translations of their work. Um, since you're in that space, you know, are you more involved, especially in the languages that you focus on? Have you been an active player in that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm really relieved when it comes out in like Korean or something, because if it's a terrible translation, I'll never know. Um, I've had a lot of experience both as a translator, as an editor of translations, and as a person who's translated myself. Um, and I do speak enough languages that I, I, I know how it works, you know, and I know that it's very dicey, you know, there are a lot of, uh, um, there's a lot of bad translations out there in the world. And this is really something that is 
hard to say because people get all up in your mentions as it were i don't have mentions thank god i, I left twitter <laughs> years ago so but you know um there's a kind of ideology around translation now that that sort of wants to say that all translations are really great. I've had horrible experiences being translated in the past. I mean, here in France, the last time, my last book, um, somebody cut entire chapters of the book and like rewrote stuff and put stuff in that he felt like putting in there. And, you know, if I hadn't been able to read that, I would have never known. And um, so, and I also think that I've been really lucky because I kind of do know about this area to have found really good people. Um, so like in Brazil, which is a country where I, you know, I'm very involved, I have just the most perfect translator and I do read it. Um, and then we have a discussion and there's always some stuff that I kind of think, you know, maybe let's try this instead of that, but it's a real privilege to be able to do it. I think it's really, um, I think it really just makes books a lot better and it's rare for Americans to be in this position that I'm in but it's not so rare for foreigners to know English. So when you're translated, if you're French, you know, most French writers know English, they might not know it perfectly, but they know it enough to read it. Um, and so they do read their translations and we don't usually. So yeah. um, that's just one of those imbalances that the English speakers confront. Yeah. Who knew that the big middle of America would be contributing so much to this? One of our great contemporary uh, translators, Jennifer Croft, is from right here in Tulsa. And oh, uh, right, yeah, and uh, you know, so you guys are you guys are doing really well for the Red River states. Um, so <laughs> I'm curious, just to get back on track here, um, when Sontag is such a uniquely American voice in the way she kind of spoke to the culture. It's almost like this idea, you know, you'll know this as as a linguist you know, the, the idea of slang and, and, you know, how how to kind of understand things. You mentioned that there's a kind of a new appraisal of her work or even an awareness in some countries because of your book. You know, what was her role outside of America at its height? Because she was so specifically looking at our culture. Did it have relevance to the broader world? And if so, when was the kind of peak of that, do you think? Well, it's really funny because actually, you know, Americans always thought of her as kind of European. You know, she was this sort of almost French figure for a lot of people. Um, even though of all the writers, of all the Jewish writers of her generation, um, she was really the only one who's pretty much from middle American suburbia. Um, I mean, her, her background is a little more complicated than that, but, you know, basically she grew up in Tucson and in LA, um, which, you know, you don't get much more US of A than that. Um, but abroad, I think because she was, you know, America is always this kind of two-headed gorgon, you know. On the one hand, it's extremely nationalistic and chauvinistic. Um, on the other hand, it's also very cosmopolitan, probably the most cosmopolitan country in the world, I would say, by far. Um, you know, we talk about people who don't speak languages, but, you know, where I'm from in Houston, Texas, According to the United States Census, more languages are spoken in the Houston metropolitan area than any other city in the country. Um, you know, I don't think if you know any um, big American city, it's absolutely, incredibly, dazzlingly cosmopolitan on a certain level, and then on a certain level, it's not. So um, Sondheim represented both of those things to, to, to Europeans, to Latin Americans. She represented the America that they wanted to believe in, which was the cosmopolitan, open, you know, the Statue of Liberty and the Metropolitan Museum and that kind of uh, world nation or nation of nations. Um, so that she was very, very famous all over the world as the kind of voice of that America. The problem with that America, um, I mean, we're from the Red River Valley, so we know how this is. Like, is that people outside of the capitals are often thought to be a lot dumber than they really are, you know? So, um, so people from Texas or Oklahoma are kind of, you know, people in New York, I mean, they look down on us and often they're right. You know, I have to say as a Texan, I was very happy that Donald Trump was from New York because we got blamed for George Bush for so long. That like, you know, I thought, okay, I don't think it changed the stereotype particularly. Um, 
But so I think it's I think it's hard for people to keep those two ideas in their head that America can be this incredibly cosmopolitan and progressive nation at the same time that it's extremely reactionary. Sontag represented one extreme of that. Um, but I, I I kind of wish there was a figure that could have reconciled those two in a certain way, at least as representing the nation to to the outside. Yeah. I want to, you know, we've got a few minutes left here. I want to touch on a couple of things about the, the, the process of the book. You know, Sontag still has, of course, a son, uh, her partner, Annie Leibovitz. Um, I believe a sister may be still living. There's, you know, there is yeah. a family of living family. You had written a great, but, you know, book about an author most people had never heard of before this. How did you land this project? And did it take some arm twisting? And, you know, obviously, you had to kind of go through some, you know, this is, this is, this, I believe this is considered an authorized biography, right? This, I don't know what the terms are authorized versus unauthorized, but yeah. You know, what was I was for? authorized. The book is not authorized. I was authorized to right. go into the, all this stuff at UCLA, which is there's a secret archive that I was allowed to go into, including her computer and a lot of diaries that hadn't been shown to the public. Um, but, but I didn't have any, I wouldn't have been able to write this if I had had to have somebody sign off on it. Um, yeah, I mean, that is a, the process of, 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 I mean, I was asked to do this based on the Clarice Lispector biography, which was really, um, you know, such a quixotic project that I pursued in the dark for many years. And then it was really successful to my astonishment. A lot of people read it. A lot of people got interested in her. It's kind of the dream, you know, when you do a project like that, but there's also a, um, you know, but I, I didn't think of myself as a biographer. And when I got asked, I got asked to do this. And the excitement of doing an American figure like that was really compelling to me because I had, you know, I've lived a lot of my life outside of the United States. Um, and so for me, it was kind of a homecoming in a certain way. Um, how I was chosen, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, her son read my book and uh, my previous book and thought I was the person to do it. And, and I actually, I kind of thought they were right, but I wasn't sure why. I still don't know why, but I thought, I thought it made sense. If, if it hadn't made sense, I wouldn't have done it. Like if I was asked to write something about a musician recently, I really don't know much about music. Like I'm not the right person to do that. Um, I like music, but I'm not technically, I don't really know how it works. But I did feel like I was the right person for this. What, was there any, um, you know, blowback or pushback on the thought that a woman should write this book? Just curious if that was ever brought up or you ever felt any pressure on that? Um, sorry, I'm fixing my hair. Um, <laughs> uh, no. Well, so this is one of these interesting things that has changed a lot. So I, 10 years ago, when I was working on Clarice, it was very rare and considered cool for a guy to write about a girl. You know, this was like, this didn't really happen so much. And in fact, that's a long sidebar in the history of, of American biography, but actually most biographers are men and most biographies are about men. So, um, so that was considered kind of cool. So about halfway down the line, that became like cultural appropriation or something. Um, I mean, these are these things that you just have to ignore. Like you have to, um, you know, speaking of translation, like if you have to meet every demographic criterion of someone, like if everybody who translates my book into Korean has to be a gay Jew from Texas, you know, <laughs> there's, I mean, so there's all these kind of things. I think that um, you just, you have to have that affinity. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was trying to think of someone from Sontag's era who would be kind of the male analogous counterpart to her. And the one that seemed the most obvious to me because of the scope of work and the idea of trying all these different things was John Updike, um, especially about you know, art, the art criticism that he did and kind of trying, trying all these different things. You know, obviously, you know, for me, you know, his true skill was in you know, writing fiction, but he wrote tons of essays. He wrote tons of criticism. He wrote a ridiculous amount of book reviews for you know, all kinds of uh, poetry. He, was, you know, he just had this uh, urge to do that. Um, did she feel competitive with her 
not just male counterparts, but did, was she a competitive person in that idea of trying to own the marketplace of ideas? Well, I mean, so John Upback, you know, the old joke is that he never had an unpublished thought. Right. Um, that's kind of true. But I mean, John Updike was this protean force. He was an incredible person. I think someone who's maybe more comparable to her in that generation is Norman Mailer, you know, who also, um, who loved a fight, you know, like Sontag did, they, you know, very opinionated, lots of tempestuous relationships, very media friendly, very politically involved. But I think that um, when you're looking at like who, um, like do people, enjoy that. I mean, maybe they do, but I think that her, I, when I look at that, she's actually, she published actually a lot less than people realize. Um, she wasn't someone like, I mean, how many novels did Philip Roth do? Oh, he's from, Blake Bailey's from Tulsa, right? Yeah, he's, yeah, he, he's been working on that. He's on our board actually, so yeah. Oh, he is? Yeah. Um, um, you know, how many novels did Philip Roth write? Dozens, you know. I mean, you know, sometimes actually like her work is a lot more concentrated in a way. Sometimes it's so concentrated that it's hard to read. You know, if you've ever read something like The Aesthetics of Silence, which is a fascinating essay. But she told someone uh, I spoke to that you had to have a new thought in every sentence, which sounds great, you know. But in fact, it makes it really hard to read because every sentence you have to, take in and then think about it and then you can move on to the next thought um so it makes her work it gives her work a different character but what that, that wasn't what you asked me i'm sorry no i was just curious about you know did she because like you know her combativeness with media you know obviously she was kind of had that relationship with a lot of media especially like you mentioned as she got older but you know did she see herself in a competitive stance against the other people talking about the culture. You mentioned Norman Mailer and, you know, Jermaine Greer and all those people. Did she kind of feel that sense of kind of literary fisticuffs wanting to kind of scoop them on what the best observation of American culture might be at that time? I don't think so. I think she was very competitive. I mean, that's, there's no question about that. Um, but first of all, I think she was competitive with herself. And second of all, I think she was competitive she was more of an admirer. I think the people that she was really attracted to and interested in were the people that she felt were her superiors. So, you know, she was absolutely fascinated by people like Joseph Brodsky, who was this natural poet in several languages, who was just this brilliant talker and this brilliant figure. Um, there were a lot of those people that she, a lot of her love affairs were with people she admired, whether it was, uh, they were politicians or actors or, 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 or writers, uh, dancers. She. I don't really see her as competitive in that way. I think that she was, you know, I think really she was competitive with herself. I think she always wanted to be more. That's what she writes in her journals. She wants to be more than she is, which is so poignant in a way because she was such a huge figure for so many people. They couldn't imagine being more than Susan Sontag, but she always felt she was falling short. Um, I've got a question here from one of our viewers, uh, Christopher, who says, and this speaks to something we were just talking about a little while ago. Did Sontag have any ideas or prescriptions to come back from the cultural unseriousness that we're deep mm -hmm. into now toward the kind of seriousness of which she was such a strong advocate? Well, so I love this question um, because it uses the word seriousness twice. Um, seriousness is the key word in Sontag's life and her work. Um, she really, really believes in the moral principles that she believes in. She really believes in the enduring value and importance of art to the point that she was willing to die for it. You know, I, the last and only trip I've taken in the last year was to Bosnia because she went to Sarajevo and it was so important to her to go there that she was willing to risk death during the war. Um, I think that trying not to be trivial, trying not to be stupid she really hated stupid because she thought stupid was evil um and i think like having lived through the trump years i think that seems really obvious now um i think that those value the value of study the value of the tradition of learning from the past uh, in order to create the future 
those are things that I, I mean, when I, I almost get emotional talking about them because I feel like we live in such a stupid, trivial world now. I feel like there's so much that goes under the name of thought. There's so many fake books. There's so many stupid things on TV. Um, maybe there always were, but you know, having, it's again, like having gone through Trump and having gone through a lot of other political experiences, um, you really realize that we need that kind of seriousness. We need that kind of focus. Um, we need that kind of cut the crapness that you can see in some of those interviews. You know, she really, um, she's tired of it. She's not like that when she's young. It's very interesting. She's kind of more tolerant. She kind of lets everybody finish their thought and everything. Um, and then I think it's just enough already. And I think I kind of, I'm feeling that now myself. Um, you know, here in, 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 in Europe, the, the virus situation, but it's not the only situation like this, but this is the one we're living through now. I mean, it has been fucked up on a scale of just the number of stupid people in charge of us and in charge of our lives and whether we can literally like walk out the door. It's just enraging. So I think more than ever, we need seriousness. We need people who aren't just mouthing off all the time, but who are really looking at the causes of things. My last question is this, you know, when you think about her legacy and, and, and you know, what people think of when they think about Susan Sontag now, you, I, it's hard for me to say this because, you know, working and living, at my, you know, we both kind of live and work around books and, and writing. And I wonder, you know, would her impact be able to be made the same way today? Because we just consume things differently. I'm not totally sure that a writer can do what she did then. They would have to almost use different tools and different platforms to kind of find that space now. Do you think that someone like her with her viewpoint would be more, she always seemed very, from what I read and what I could see on the interviews, very uh, opposed to the idea of like ever being in politics, for example. But mm -hmm. would someone like that who felt the need to kind of contribute and say something be more apt to being involved in that way now, you know, if she was here uh, in this current space? Well, I think that, you know, she was criticized often. We alluded to this a little bit. She was often criticized for being too pop. You know, she was for being too photographable, for being in the wrong magazine, you know, not the boring magazine that nobody read, but she was in Vogue or she was in the New York Times. Um, and I think that now we're all trying to figure out, I mean, we as citizens and also as writers or artists, we're trying to figure out like, what's the right degree of relevance? You know, is it relevant that you spend your whole day yelling at people on Twitter? Well, a lot of people seem to think that because if you look at Twitter, people are just spewing out crap all to the four winds all the time. And it's kind of, you just think like people are insane. Um, but I think that we are in a moment where we're trying to figure out like, how do we communicate with people? How do we reach audiences that we feel have something to, um, you know, who are still susceptible to literature and art? I've always thought those people were out there. I mean, this is something that um, I, I got a lot of response to in Brazil. Because you know, Brazil is a country that officially, if you ask any literate Brazilian, they'll say Brazilians don't read, they're not interested, all they do is watch porn on their iPhones and you know, go on Facebook, which, okay, yeah, it's true. It's true probably everywhere. Um, but I always thought like there's, this is a big important country. And a lot of people like if you, even if they don't know about Clarice Lispector, if you go and explain it to them, they'll be into it. Not everybody. Um, not everybody is interested in stuff in general, but I was really sure about that. And everywhere I went for years, um, I mean, I don't do it now because I can't go anywhere, but um, even in little towns that were kind of hicky little backwoods parts of Brazil, I would have 500 people show up to hear about Clarice Spectre. And some of them were six year olds and some of them were 90 year olds. And so I think that you have to keep the faith that people do want um, real stuff and try to offer real stuff to people and not condescend and not dumb it down. Um, I mean, that's why Sontag for me is such a, you know, she's such an inspiring figure because 
you can say whatever you want to say about her. And it's all true, you know, good, bad, ugly. But she was absolutely true to herself in that sense. She never dumbed it down. She made people want to be better. She made people want to be smarter. She made people want to read more. She made people want to travel more and learn more. And, you know, that's why for me, she just continues to be such an inspiration. Yeah. No, I, I think it's a good place to end on too, because I do think you're right. And the idea that, you know, we're often told that there's this silent majority that impedes progress. And that's been, we've talked about since the Nixon era, but there are these kind of silent minorities that kind of make an aggregate up that do kind of keep these things going and, and give us hope for, um, you know, the future. Just this last year it was the horrible year, but it was the best year for, for books like in the last 20 years, you know? So yeah, we're returning to books. So we have to yeah. find those silver linings where we can, you know? Yeah, and I think it's good to assume that people are interested rather than assume that people are not interested. Yeah, yeah. Well, this was a, a, a true blast. Thank you for taking some time to join us on a somewhat late evening over there. And, and uh, I hope that we can uh, do it sometime in person when you ever get back over to the States. And the I know, I would love to do anything in person, especially <laughs> this. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all for watching. Stay safe, and we will talk to you very soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night.